Is it okay if I put you on the spot? I just want you to come up. I love seeing the freedom of children to dance and praise. Isn't that beautiful? We should all be doing that in here, shouldn't we? Like somebody knows how to worship. We got one. Would you just pray before you bust out to children's church? Lord Jesus, thank you for coming and being amongst us and coming amongst the young ones and the old ones alike. Pray that we will experience your presence in every room of this church. See, I knew I wanted you to pray. <laughs> so, oops, let's get rid of this. Let's pray some more. You want to? <laughs> Father, we thank you um, that we're already experiencing your anointing in this place before we even um, go to teach about it, learn of you, and uh, grow greater into your anointed. That's my prayer, Father, as it has been um, through this series. I ask you in the authority of the name of Jesus that we are, you, you are making us into, we are becoming greater in your anointing to make an impact for your glory in this world. We want to we wanna heal. We want to break bondages. We want to bless. We want to have your authority and your presence on it. And so will you teach us of yourself? I ask, Lord, that you would open hearts that we experience this as an invitation. I know that's a miracle. There's, there's so much broken. There's so much bruised and, and wounded in all of us that, um, that we often fail to hear or sense or feel your invitation. So I'm asking for a, near, for a miracle in my anointing right now, Lord, that there would be, that there would be an openness created in the heart. That uh, you, you are worthy because Jesus made you worthy for the anointing. You are called because Jesus made it possible for you to be called. I ask Jesus that these words could be received, that there would be a great invitation this morning to join you in your anointing. Do you agree with that? Amen. Amen. Okay. So um, we're on the third message of this series. And I tell you that because... Um, I was going to begin this series by giving an, an, um, a foundation or an introduction to anointing in the kingdom of God. Just first of all, what is it? Is it for the New Testament church or is, is it just Old Testament things we read about for prophets and kings? And um, what is it? And I thought I was going to do that in one message, very, very foolishly. <laughs> thought we're on the third one, but I do think, and this is what I want to tell you, this is, this is the bottom line. That's what we're going to do this morning, of an introduction. And so I want you to know, even in advance, what we're going to do now, after this morning, unless the Lord changes this or something, um, we're going to begin to dig into the nitty-gritty of it. In other words, spiritual competence is where we go from here. If, um, if anointing is his plan for his bride, for his church, for the body of Christ, and if it's for us, and that's actually how we, we are to be living, then um, we need some competence and I'm, I'm number me among you. We need great competence in how does that work? How do we receive greater anointing? How do we make it so that it remains? It says of Jesus that it came upon and remained. How do we live a life where it remains? Um, how, wh- how does that affect leadership? And I'm just, I mean, yes, I am talking about leadership of the church, but do you know, I, you hear me say this all the time, you all lead something. At the very least, you lead your own life. Or you co-lead with your spouse in your household. Um, You lead things at work. You all lead things. And so how does that work for leadership? The word of God is not silent. In fact, it's loaded with anointing and leadership. Um, We're going to go in. So that's like three examples of like, I don't know which ones he's going to have me do. Six or eight topics that's going to make his church competent in anointing. Does that sound good? Okay. This morning... 
We're just going to finish kind of foundational stuff, but um, I believe that the sad, that's kind of a strong word. Well, it is sad. The sad part is, I think it's stuff that the church has sort of lost. So when we say foundational, don't get, don't get me wrong, we're not doing dull stuff here. I believe it's stuff that should be 101, but for most of us anymore, it's not. It's, um, we've lost touch with um, how the Spirit means to move ever so powerfully through the body of Christ. In other words, through you. And, um, and boy, if there's anything we can't lose, it, it's got to be that, Right? So I want to just start, like, literally at the foundation. Um, the Lord does not change, and yet there is an Old Testament and a New Testament. What's up there? He has different covenants that we operate in during different seasons. But the heart of the Father, His ways still have not changed from one to the other. Okay, so it's very important if we're going to, where we're headed, if we're going to, even just this morning, where we're headed, if we're going to draw the gold from the word of God, we, we have to understand that anointing, as it is from the heart of the Father, as it is part of his plan, has not changed. And yet there's something we have to talk about that has changed. <laughs> you got it? That's kind of a circle. So let me move on quick so you don't sit there swimming. Um, how did it start? It started in a, in a garden. God made man, and he said, I give you dominion. In other words, what? I want you to represent. I want you to be the ambassador of the courts of heaven and represent with the ruling of heaven upon the earth. That was the good plan. And we messed it up. Okay, so what happened? What's the problem there? Do you know that man still has dominion? We didn't lose dominion at the fall. In fact, that's the problem. Just look around. If you use dominion with in spiritual death, in other words, without the anointing, without that intimate fellowship through the Holy Spirit with, with the Father so that you're representing the courts, then you're representing something else and it all falls apart. Basic theology, right? You're, we're still ruling, believe me. It's just, it's just, you know, across the earth, the humans, unfortunately, are still very much ruling. <laughs> it's just what that brings about, apart from the Spirit of God, the ability to represent heaven correctly leaves us here, okay? Um, now, here's, here's the thing. Um, so, in other words, it was always... God's idea, in fact, from the beginning, it already was, it was God's idea that we would reign with him. You are meant to rule with Jesus Christ in this place. And so, yes, anointing was for, for prophets, um, kings, and I'm blanking, king, prophet, a uh, priest. Anointing were for them roles. Do you know what your roles are in the kingdom of God? Prophet, priest, and king. Those are your roles, and I'm going to show very clearly in the Word of God how that works, both in the spiritual realm and how our bodies in God's design touch the physical realm, operating in the three roles of Jesus' anointing. So what happens? In the Old Testament, post-fall, we lost that fellowship. And now just bear with me. We have to do this. And then we had, what happened? God said, no, my reign is going to be on the earth. Right? So what did he do? He called out for himself a people and he put his anointing upon prophets, priests, and kings, started as judges, and then it became kings, so that there were some with the Spirit upon in that way so that the rule of heaven could be in this place. And what we're just singing this, Jesus, um, it's uncanny how this works. Jesus, um, when asked how to pray, what did he pray? That, that heaven would come to earth. In other words, what? Restore the dominion that was originally intended. He is, it was always his plan that man would have that dominion, and he loves so well that he's not going to do it apart from you. He's going to, his, his great big idea is that he's going to, he restores the spirit upon so that once again we are representing the rule of heaven and we're making it happen here or we're supposed to be. 
I hate the word supposed to. Somebody's got to help me get a better word. If, you know, for the joy, the participation, his love for you is so great that his, there, there we go, is that his plan is that you're participating in that. But now what happens? Is there a change from Old to New Testament? There's no change in the Father's heart. There's no change in his idea that it is the Spirit upon. It is intimate fellowship with him. It is the anointing that makes us rule rightly with Jesus Christ. That has not changed. So what has changed? What's changed is, I want to read, um, to do this part, go to Acts chapter 2. And I'm going to read in verse 14. This is the first Spirit-filled sermon except for Jesus's. And actually, that's a terrible way to say it because there were, there were spiritual sermons all through the Old Testament, wasn't there? But this is just after Pentecost and, and Peter here is what we're reading about. And it's just going to show us very clearly what the change of anointing is, the age that you live in. Isn't it important to live in the correct age, <laughs> era? Okay, verse 14 but Peter, standing up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk as you suppose. Now let me stop for a second. Why You all know the story, but it's so important to point this out this morning in this context. Why did they think they were drunk? They had such a measure of the presence of God upon them. They had such an outpouring of anointing that was in operation, which creates an overflow of joy and power manifesting from the rule of heaven that they just supposed they were drunk. You can't be that happy. I don't know if they were slurring their words or in joy or what they were doing, but the Holy Spirit was so powerful upon them, they thought they must be drunk. And so and that's the anointing, okay? Anybody experience that? The anointing so powerful that you're thinking, you're thinking, what is happening to me? Like this is, I've been overtaken by God in this moment. That's what this is recording. And it says, for these are not drunk as you suppose, since it is only the third hour of the day. So in other words, <laughs> I don't know why that's his argument. I don't know. Obviously, not, we're not going to drink a bunch of wine in the morning. <laughs> But this is what was spoken by the prophet Joel. And here's the big shift, okay? And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God. Yes. Who says this? God. So take it to the bank, that I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions. Your old men shall dream dreams. Now, church, just, just to get us rolling here, just, to, just as a warm-up, <laughs> Let's get this straight. The big change is it went from anointing coming on occasion on some in order to represent to keep a people in the bounds of the reign of heaven to the spirit being poured out on all flesh. That's the age you live in. All flesh who would receive it. Now that's a big difference. Nothing, here's what we got to get straight though and partly why I'm doing this. Nothing about the anointing and recognize the anointing is, is a person. It's the Holy Spirit, okay? We just have to say that about 10 times this morning so you don't walk away thinking it's an it <laughs> or, a, or a force of its own. The anointing is God. It's effective presence upon. Nothing about the anointing, what it is, how it operates in the kingdom, how it is is one of the Lord's greatest ways that he wants you to be loved by having the person of the Holy Spirit, the anointing on you like that, upon you. Um, none of that, how it operates in the kingdom or anything, has changed. The only thing that's changed in this age, and we're going to read about it this morning, is that it is available to all flesh. It's poured out on all flesh. It's the restoration of what was intended in the garden. So we're not, re listen, this is what we do. We look at the church and the anointing, the concept of the anointing or power in the church is one of the things that has been, been more abused than anything else. Why? Because it's everything. It's the, it's the nucleus of the warfare we're in. And so what happens is the warfare against it has made it that we think that this powerful presence of the Holy Spirit, his anointing on the body of Christ, is the abnormal. It's when it kind of, 
gets kind of weird for a moment, and we think of it that way, where these outworkings are the exception, right? How, how many of you, at least some point in your life, you've thought that way about the anointing? Okay, the anointing is God's normal. He means for that to be normal. Let me tell you something. When the church is weak and impotent, <laughs> that's not normal. And there are measures. This is one of the teachings we're going to talk about. There are different measures. It's very scriptural. You can't walk away from the scriptures not knowing that you walk in a measure of anointing. Do you know you're more anointed right now? You have more of the effective presence of God than you're aware of sitting there this morning. I promise you, you have more than you're aware of. You also have infinite new wine and anointing that he has planned for you. Thank God, yes, because tell me that, tell me that this is not as, as powerful and effective as he means for me to be, please. Well, the word of God makes it clear that there is more, more, more. He means to make us so powerful that we're unmistakable, untouchable, and then he's going to come back and say, my bride's ready. Amen. Okay. We're going to completely focus on, well, we already have been, but we're going to completely focus on Jesus this morning. And what we're going to do is we're going to look at Jesus' anointing. What was it? Do you know this is the Word of God? The Word of God tells you exactly what Jesus' anointing was. Are you aware of that? Go to, uh, turn to Luke chapter 4 with me, or press the buttons on your phone to get there. I'm going to start in verse 16. Thank you. Luke 4, starting verse 16. To prepare for today, um, I did an exercise. It's the second time I've done this. Um, first time was years ago. But every once in a while, I get a fire to look at like every word in the original language of a little passage and it's unbelievable how it'll open up to you if there's a passage worth worth doing that on i'm going to suggest it's this one it's the anointing of jesus and before we're done today you're going to know exactly why it's so important so starting verse 16 so he jesus came to nazareth where he had been brought up and as his custom was he went into the synagogue on the sabbath day and stood up to read and he was handed the book of the prophet Isaiah, and when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written. So now, he's going to start reading what is basically Isaiah 61, okay? They didn't, it wasn't Isaiah 61 back then, it was a spot on a scroll. <laughs> it's been divided up now, it's Isaiah 61, and what you need to understand is just by coincidence, it was his turn to read the way it would work in the synagogue as we've talked about. Um, he, you know, the, the, the men would share the responsibility to stand up and read, begin to read the scroll, and then they would go back to their seat. Jesus, scholars generally think, and I agree, that he didn't go back to his seat. He went and sat in Moses' seat, which you don't signifying I am the Messiah, and what I just read is fulfilled in your hearing today. That's why their eyes were fixed on him. I'm sure their jaws were dropped open. Um, Okay, so that's where we're at in this. Now I'm just going to start reading. This is the anointing. Verse 18 says, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Do you know that you're made for the Spirit of the Lord to be upon you? In fact, I need to say, I need to say one thing I've said over and over in, these, in the beginning messages of this series. Um, Jesus modeled the anointing life. Because he's your rabbi. Because he was laying out something for you to follow. Okay? Are you with me? Jesus, Jesus walked on water. Do you know you walk on water? 
I'm serious. In a spiritual sense, it's so very important you understand that he was a man who ministered by the anointing of the Spirit. We know that because it's recorded in this verse we're reading right now. Do you, do you know that spiritually speaking? I'm not going to dig into this because we'll rabbit trail way too long, but meditate on this sometime. Ask the Lord, how do I walk on water? If I'm to be exactly like my rabbi, what is that and how do I do that? Try it. You'd be surprised. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. Why? Because he has anointed me. So you can put the theology debate to rest. Jesus was anointed. (laughs) And that's how he walked in the Spirit. There was, we said this last week, there there was an extraordinary and unbelievable change in his life, in the way that he was living his life, pre-anointing, which pre-anointing at his baptism, when the heavens were opened, the dove descended upon, and it says about him in the Gospel of John that the Spirit remained. And after the Spirit remained, there was an unbelievable difference in our King's life. He, the, here's the first one. He marched into the synagogue, made an announcement, and sat in the seat. <laughs> he sat down. <laughs> that's, that's a big one. Now we're going to read about other things that he did, okay? Now, what comes next is a listing that is specifically what the Lord's anointing is. It's so important to pay attention and pick this apart because, actually, I'm going to let the cat out of the bag just so that you struggle with it a little bit as we go. This is going to be challenging for some. His anointing is your anointing. So now just hold on to that, and here's the first part of it, okay? To preach the gospel to the poor. Now let me tell you about that. We're going to see words in here like preach and proclaim. At least that's how it's translated in the New King James Version. (laughs) I want to tell you about these words. You know, he created by spoken word. When he spoke, it was made. Do you know that he put that in you? You know that you create with your words. So be very careful, okay? You can create the ugliest of things, (laughs) <laughs> or you can join the Spirit of God and create what he's making in his kingdom. And these words preach and proclaim, actually, now remember, we're talking about anointing, which I should tell you literally how that, what that is. It's, it's charisma, not charisma, but charisma, which is the special endowment of the Holy Spirit. It also means um, smearing, or, or anointing like we think of it, okay? So that's anointing, and that's what we're reading about. So the word preach, proclaim, in other words, is not just proclaim like, um, I proclaim the service is going to be done at 11 or something like that. It's we're talking about a special endowment of power on your words. In other words, to, to proclaim with the authority of heaven with, a, with an ability for transformation and change, for creation to happen, that's what these words mean. It means to, to proclaim, because we're talking about anointing, special endowment of the Spirit so that you can be an ambassador, so that you can, so you're capable of representing the Father's heart. Does that make sense? So it's so important when you read these words, preach, and we're going to see the word proclaim twice, that we're talking about, talking about words with his ability in them. Okay, and so what's this? We're proclaiming the gospel, good news to the poor. Okay, the poor. They did use the word poor to describe what we normally think of, the beggars or those without money, homeless people or or whatever. Yes, they use the word that way. But when you look at what the word actually means, it simply means the distressed or strained. So now listen, Jesus' anointing was to be able to proclaim with power in the anointing of the Holy Spirit to proclaim good news, a relieving news to the distressed. Is anybody around distressed people in your days? Is anybody distressed? <laughs> yeah, it's a, world, it's a fallen world. It's a, so this is an anointing to what? Bring heaven into this. 
It's an anointing to, to have a proclamation, and that is both in words and deeds, okay? We, we think of preach or proclaim as words only, but let me tell you, the most powerful preaching is not when I'm blabbing. That's powerful too. I'm not minimizing that. But the most powerful preaching is the way that we live that brings heaven into people's lives with the anointing of power. And this is to relieve distress. Then he goes on and says, He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted. Part two of this anointing. Okay? How are you sent? It's so important we get this. What did Jesus say? You are sent. Just after the resurrection, he's appearing to, to the disciples and he says, um, as my father sent me, so I now send you. What's that mean? Power and authority. Power and, authority. And, and exactly in, in every way, ex, um, the as part is exactly like. So exactly like he sent me in the flesh into the world to minister this way, in exactly that way, no difference about it whatsoever, is his plan for you to be sent. Well, how was he sent? Here's another, here's another aspect of how he was sent. He was sent to heal the brokenhearted. Brokenhearted is one word. And it is one word in the original language. It actually means crushed or shattered of heart. Now, this is going to become important in, for in a minute, so let me do this. Um, you know, you are body, soul, and spirit by God's design in, in perfect unity, inseparable from each of the parts, your body, soul, and spirit, okay? Heart is at the core of your entire identity. And just for this morning, we could teach an entire series or a whole year on heart, right? But just for this morning, I want you to realize what this is saying is that, is that his anointing was to heal shattered and crushed of heart. Are you around people that are shattered of heart? The core of motivation, the core of, of my reason is what heart is, not reason like logic, but my, my pur purpose, reason that, that fuels me, that propels me. When that's shattered, the human race is really in trouble. And the anointing is to heal the shattered of heart. And then what? To proclaim liberty... To the captives. This is one of my favorites. It just, it, I mean, you know, all of these, you, you can just read it in the English, and it, it means what it means, but this is so much richer. Do you know that the word liberty here, of course it means freedom. So we could say, the anoint, Jesus' anointing was to proclaim, remember, that's, that's with power. That's not just, pro, you know, <laughs> proclaiming words. We're talking about the anointing of effective words to proclaim, we could say freedom, but I want to tell you that word, when you look at it very closely, it's actually a legal term, and it means pardon. Do you know what pardon is? I, I know you know. Let me tell you anyway. Um, pardon means that there actually was a conviction. There is actually guilt. Okay, um, there is actually a legal problem that has conviction. And you know, conviction in the courts has consequence. It has a sentence. Okay, and so this is um, to proclaim with power pardon. What is pardon? Pardon is freedom from all consequence that would be caused by that guilt. For the captives. Now, you can't make this up. Captives, of course, it means bondage or, you know, in captivity, right? Is the easiest way to do this. But when you look literally in the language, it means prisoners of war. Did you know that? I'd forgotten that. The last time I did this exercise, I saw that and I'd forgotten that. Do you know one of the problems we have is that we don't know we're in a warfare. And the people around you, the lost that you encounter every day, they don't know they're in a warfare. All they know is they're screwed up, they can't get freedom, they're miserable, and they can't figure out what they're doing around here. They don't know that it is a prison cell. They don't know that it is a war that has an enemy that is putting them there in the prison cell. And I'm going to tell you this, soak this one up for a minute. It's also true about you. 
<laughs> you, if you think you don't still have cages that were created by the warfare on you, then uh, what does the word of God say? If you, if you don't think you have sin, then you lie. And those are the cages, okay? And this says that Jesus' anointing is to proclaim with power pardon for prisoners of war. We must never lose sight of the fact that the enemy hates Jesus. And if you like him at all, <laughs> then that means he hates you too. That's really the only reason he hates you. He doesn't have any regard for you. It's just that he hates Jesus and his kingdom. Jesus is the one who has regard for you. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> The next thing in the anointing to proclaim liberty, there's the word again, pardon. Where am I? Liberty um, and recovery of, what did I do? Did I skip? Bear with me here, people, to proclaim liberty to the captives. And, okay, the next thing I'm supposed to be reading is, and recovery of sight to the blind. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I know your giggle. That's a Holy Spirit giggle. Um, yeah, and yes, they used the word blind to talk about the physically blind. Okay, they did. But do you know that that word just simply means, um, I'm going to make a mark here. For some reason, I have too many scribbles and it makes me lose my place. <laughs> it literally means um, physically or mentally opaque or smoky. You know, everybody around you is opaque and smoky. About what? Everything. I like that. That's right. <laughs> that's right. I don't know what circle you hang out in. No, yeah, that's, that's absolutely right. But opaque and smoky about last week's message. The Father's love. They have no idea. They don't even have the ability <laughs> to know that they're loved. You know, when you're blind, you can't just choose like, well, I don't like this anymore. <laughs> I want to see. You need a miracle to, re to move the smoke so that you need, in other words, remember, we're still reading about anointing. We're not reading about things when Jesus laid down his glory. We're not reading about things he was capable of as a man. The Word of God says he emptied himself. He was capable because, the, because of the special endowment that came upon and remained. The, the Spirit of the Lord was upon him because he was anointed. And his anointing was to open eyes so that the, so that the Father's heart could be revealed. I wanted, I felt like on this one, I needed to give um, an example and something transparent from my life. It may sound like I'm patting myself on the back. Please don't do that. I'm patting the Holy Spirit and the power of the anointing. Um, we're going to get to this. I want to tell you most of the time I'm living with, just to be transparent, well, um, without the Spirit remaining. I do that far more often than the Spirit being upon. Okay? Just so you know. We're talking about God's plans God's heart. And every once in a while, <laughs> on a really good day, the anointing is really powerful. You might even think I'm drunk. <laughs> That's not this story. I'm in the, I want to tell you a story, though, so you can see recovery of sight to the blind. Because, and I want to tell you why first. You know what we do? We over-mystify this stuff. Do you know that um, the physical world is what's more alien? <clears throat> when we make the spiritual realms and the things of the spirit so mystical that, that, that we can't touch it, that it's not reality, then we've done something tragic with it because this is God's normal. So yes, we've all, well, I shouldn't say that. Maybe we all haven't. Um, some of us have been in services where the anointing gets so heavy you can feel the weight. Um, you see creative miracles where fingers come where there wasn't one or, you know, the, these things happen and that's wonderful. But if we leave it in a realm like that, then, then we exit it from our everyday, every moment life where the spirit remains 
in your days and you're executing the will of heaven properly reigning because the spirit's upon you in your days so let me give you a story um this was actually years ago, and I actually had to pray. I'm like, Lord, is there any example in my life <laughs> where I can give an example of the Spirit just operating in the normal, the anointing and that ability of the Spirit operating in the normal? You'd think you could think of hundreds of them from your life, but I'm going, if you want me to speak this, you're going to have to tell me one. After about a half an hour of prayer, this, this comes to my mind. I was once in a grocery store, I'm in the checkout lane, and there's someone up checking out in front of me. I, she only had a couple of items, like a loaf of bread and I think like a bottle of medicine. So there's not a whole bunch, there's not a whole bunch there. She's just trying to check out. And she's in that moment that if you're anything like me, I've had this moment about a hundred times in my life. There's something wrong with my card. It's probably deficient funds in my case. But I've also had where like just the card, you know, it gravels in your wallet when you work under cars and stuff. Like I do sometimes and it just won't run. And I can see that um, she is becoming more embarrassed as the line. She needs this. I, I'm looking, I'm like, oh, that's medicine. She needs that. And I'm, I'm standing there and I sense the Lord and I know that it's the Lord. I hope you have experiences like this. I sense him say, she doesn't know I love her. And um, I'm so dense <laughs> that I feel the weight of that and I feel the sadness and I'm like, oh, and I'm standing there like, like this and I'm, I'm just feeling it, thinking she, she doesn't know that the father is crazy about her. She doesn't know he loves her. And then, and then I sense the Lord <laughs> jolt me like, are you... Will you do something about it? And then, and of course, I'm like, oh, oh, yeah, right. <laughs> like, like, it's not just to be sad about. <laughs> we should do something about this. So, and, and it was so the Lord. I'm telling you, I would have been dense to recognize that she didn't know that. I would have been, see, this is moving in the anointing. I would have been dense, to, <laughs> even denser, to know that the Lord was calling me to bring heaven to earth and to open smoky eyes. Okay, so I step up and I don't know, it was all of like $8.50 or something to execute a miracle. <laughs> so I stepped up and I said, I said, oh, let me get, I'm sure there's just a problem with your card. Let me get that. Is it okay with you? Of course, ask permission, be respectful. And I say, um, is it okay if I use my card? And she's like, oh, thank you. She's so grateful. And um, I run the card and as she's walking away, I, our, as they're like getting the receipt and she's getting ready to walk away, I can remember saying, you know, I feel like the Lord just wanted you to know today that um, he sees you. He sees that struggle and he really loves you. And her face lit up like you could see that it was a miracle. That's the anointing. It's not just when we bring people up here and have physical healings when the Lord wants to move like that and, and people laying around on the floor on the carpet. Where the anointing is the effective miracle of God on people's hearts. Every time Jesus physically healed someone or broke a demonic bondage, there was a miracle in the heart that revealed the Father's heart, that healed blind eyes. Even when he wasn't healing blind people, he was healing blind eyes in the anointing, revealing the Father's heart, the love of them, the love for them that he has. Now here's what we have to say. And this was so powerfully on my heart as I prepared, okay? Do you know that doing kind acts is not the anointing? I'm not telling you not to do kind acts. I mean, live generously. <laughs> be nice to people because it's cool to be nice. But that is not the anointing. Do you know that? I could have went and paid for every other person's... Well, I couldn't have because I wouldn't have had enough money. But I could have went and paid for everybody else's groceries in the whole store and it would not have been moving or operating in the anointing of the Holy Spirit upon me. Sensitivity to the move of the Spirit in this moment. It was this miracle that the Lord wanted to do for a person. When Jesus was um, 
at the pool of Bethsaida, which was the healing pool, and the first person in, <laughs> the winner of the race for a bunch of wounded, broken people trying to get in, um, the first one in would get their healing. In other words, there would have been, I, I honestly don't know, there would have been tens or, or a hundred people around the pool who'd been there maybe f for, for decades. They'd been there for decades trying to be first. Just one day, that's all I need, one day where I'm first and I get in the pool. And you know, Jesus had to, had to walk through this mass of people who needed freedom and healing and he beelined to one. Why? He was operating in the anointing. This was the day for God's miracle for this one. And without, without sensitivity, with, first of all, without the anointing, we can do nothing apart from him, the word of God says. So without the anointing, you can do kind acts today and every day until the day you die, and you will probably not have produced a drop of lasting fruit for the kingdom of God. Because the kingdom of God is spirit. And it operates in the anointing of God. That is why it requires intimacy to do anything for the kingdom of God. You're never going to go off on your own and operate for the glory of God or his kingdom. <laughs> it is only going to be by the anointing and the spirit upon that, that you're operating in the kingdom of God. Recovery of sight to the blind. Did you know that it is your calling to open blind eyes? To set at liberty those are, who are oppressed. This, this is my favorite. So, so again, this is pardon. The, the, um, this is pardon. This is freedom. But those who are oppressed, I have to, we all know what oppression is. But I want to tell you what, how this word literally translates. Those who are bruised, broken, wounded. In other words, we're granting freedom to those that have been battered. Do you know we all have experiences that have lied about God, that have lied about who we are to God, that have lied about the calling he has for us in this great anointing. All of us. Every one of us has things that are broken, that are bruised, that are wounded. And it is the anointing of Jesus to set that at liberty. That's the inner healing ministry of the church, of which you're a part of. Whether you're in the formal inner healing ministry here or not, God is providing encounters for you with people who are battered and bruised. Um, the Lord gave me just this morning, I want to read this. Isaiah 42.3 is prophesying about the anointing of Jesus. And he says, A bruised reed he will not break, and smoking flax he will not quench. He will bring forth justice for truth. Justice for the sake of truth. What's that? A bruised reed he, he will not break. I want to tell you what the scripture is doing. His heart is bent toward, inclined at the bruised, the broken, the wounded. Those that who have endured the trauma where the royalty of who they are before God has been taken. And I want to put this out there. I have to do this. You know, the word of God says, freely you have received, freely give. What's that about? You, um, there is nothing in the anointing that you're going to operate in until you've received it first. And you are still receiving every line of this. That's from glory to glory to glory. He wants you to have ever-increasing measure of the Spirit upon so that you're operating in the anointing. That's supposed to be your normal. In order to get there, there all of these things are being, are being freed and, and released and eyes opened and, and healing. Um, everything that we have read is still going on in your life. And to the measure that that is happening, 
You are becoming a temple of the Holy Spirit that has greater and greater measure to do the impossible according to this realm for his spiritual realm for his kingdom. Now, here, here's the main thing I need to say. Um, we tend to look at Jesus' life as if it is something that stands, that stands in a realm that is, that is beyond us, where the truth is, it is what you're invited into, into his life, exactly like that. As he was is what you're being invited into upward to. Now watch this. I know I have one more line to read here, and I'm going to, but I want to tell you this first. So you're thinking this when we go there. Um, help me with this, Father. Um, do you think that he would go through all this trouble to make you his anointed, to give you a different anointing than was his? Okay, we are the body of Christ. What is a body? <laughs> a body is what allows us to interact, to impact, to bridge from the spiritual to the physical realm here. It's part of the reason he came in the flesh to live the anointed life that, to, that he's going to that he planned to invite you into. A body is, is how we interact with the rule of heaven in this place. And it is no mistake that he chose to say we are his body. Individually, collectively, we are his body. In other words, what? It, it, say again. We interact with the world, with this body. But how? By the anointing. Now listen, it doesn't even make, it's not biblical, first of all, but it doesn't even make any sense that you would have some other anointing than he had if you are his body. <laughs> so I dare you to meditate on that, to think about, um, we mentioned walking on water. Think about all the things that Jesus did and and meditate on this anointing. Because if you walk around going, oh Lord, I don't know what my anointing is. I don't know. And I get it. We're, before this series is over, we're going to talk about the difference between anointing and spiritual gifts. We're going to talk about how you, how you operate in those, what the Word of God tells us about how that works. We're going to become competent in this. You want to? Okay, but meditate, you've got to start here. I don't care what you do, what your uniqueness, what your ministry, what your calling, how it changes from one season to the next because the Spirit of the Lord, come, you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it's going. It blows like the wind. We walk through seasons where right now this is really powerful calling for me and it looks totally different in another season. And all of that is true because it's yielding to a person. It's not a mysterious power that we get. It's, it's, a, it's a completely non-mysterious person who loves you like crazy and wants you to execute the miracles for him, the miracles of the heart. And so meditate on this. I dare you. And the whole time you do it, meditate on how did Jesus live that and how is that my anointing? Because this is your anointing. Now I'm going to read the last line. Um, verse 19 is the final piece of his anointing. And, there's, and so therefore, whose anointing? Yours. Yours. In fact, say this with me. This is my anointing. I'm growing into greater measure of it all the time. Yeah, you're becoming more, what is it? You're becoming more and more the temple of the Holy Spirit. He wants you to have fullness. I was going to, did I read that last week? I was going to read that, the book of Ephesians. You're made for fullness. How many of you feel like you have the fullness? <laughs> How many of you feel like that every once in a while? You're on your way. <laughs> You're on your way. Yeah. <laughs> okay, here's the last line. To proclaim 
the acceptable year of the Lord. This is the line that I think is, um, it's just, I think it's so terrible the way that they, the order and the way that they put those words. Because this is what this means. Notice the word proclaim again. Okay? So, with creational authority, <laughs> the anointing is to have miraculous authority from the throne to proclaim what? The acceptable. Now, let, let's look at this. This is accepted this word, and approved, okay? So, and the word year, um, they would use that word to describe like the 365 day all through the season, you know, the annual year. But more often than not, that word was used to denote like age or era, okay? So, in other words, you have supernatural ability and the anointing to proclaim, to speak creational words, <laughs> in, uh, to proclaim the acceptance and the approval of God. You live in the era where the acceptance and approval is universally available and you have the anointing to proclaim it. That you are, what? Accepted into the beloved. You are approved for the good works of the reign of heaven in this place. I'm pulling out scriptures I know that use those words just as I stand here. But you live in that era. The anointing is for the era where you go around and you tell people you're accepted, you're approved. Do you know that almost nobody you encounter on a daily basis, and I think I'm accurate in saying this, knows that they are accepted and approved? Some people believe it's possible for them to get there. A few people believe they could be an ex accepted and approved, but what do they believe along with it? I could be accepted if I, <laughs> if I worked hard enough to, or if I quit, then I could be accepted. And this says you have creational power with your mouth, with your actions to be the body of Christ, to proclaim with power that they already are accepted and approved. You live in that era, wounded person. Let me tell you, let me tell you something with power. You, you are, and I'm, I'm, I'm illustrating what, what our calling is to do with others. You are accepted and approved. Do you know, I think as a church, we've become very good at noticing, recognizing how people are broken. <laughs> we're really good at pointing out their sin. And we're terrible, for the most part, most of the time, at proclaiming the acceptable year of the Lord. We're terrible at the proclaiming, it doesn't matter. You live in the area of being accepted. <laughs> He's inviting you to become of the Beloved. There's a huge difference between trying to do any of these things as kind acts and living an anointed life. There's nothing wrong with giving to the poor. <laughs> but when it's a move of the Spirit, there's a miracle you're not capable of that comes in the power of the anointing. I pray all the time. There's nothing wrong with teaching beautifully true, true things. It's wonderful. <laughs> but in the absence of the anointing, it lacks the power for the miracle of the heart. That's my primary prayer. I mean, I live my day, but this, I take this very seriously and um, very seriously before the Lord and I'm just using me as an example, okay? It's, I, I come up here with, um, with such great humility. I, I show up here way too early. Someday I'm gonna heal to where I can be much healthier to where I don't have to show up so early in the morning. <laughs> Feel like I need to get all prayed up. And, but I'm telling you what I'm doing. I'm saying, Lord, I, I want the anointing because I'm absolutely certain I can go say everything true and I can do a great job, have a crystal clear teaching and it'd be totally powerless. And so I'm asking the Lord, I need your anointing. I need a weight of your presence that carries the miracle with the words. And I'm just using as an example, he has plans for you. He has plans for you and for you. And you, and you all know that. But this morning, you've got to stop and go for anything that I do. 
I need the anointing of God. I need the presence that leads me, not just to do a random kind act to some person, but to be in the move of the Spirit for a particular person when the Spirit's moving for this miracle in their heart. That's the anointing. Jesus lived that life before us. I feel like I um, should do this. Um, go to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And I'm wrapping with this, okay? <laughs> Verse 16. 2 Corinthians 5, 16. <clears throat> Speaking of the anointing and the ministry that you're called to. Do you know, you know that you're called to ministry? <laughs> We've, we have this terrible saying in our culture that, well, he was called to the ministry or she was called into the ministry. And I'm thinking, well, duh. <laughs> you mean he finally came into awareness that he's called into the ministry? <laughs> okay, here it says, Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. What's that saying? That's saying what I just said. <laughs> we don't regard, we're not talking about acts of kindness, physical things. We're talking about the Lord using physical things with the anointing being regarded according to a spiritual realm. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, now listen, yet now we know him thus no longer. Why? Why? We now realize that, that even when he was in the flesh, ministering exactly as you're called to do in your life, um, that he was already operating in a spiritual plane that, that they were, he was just first modeling, that they knew very little about. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. What becomes new? <laughs> Attaboy. All things, that's right. <laughs> All things have become new. How are we a new creation? How? In what way? In this way. The Spirit comes upon and makes a dead spirit alive. It becomes the dwelling place, the temple. It's everything we're, we're talking about this morning, but you need to see it in the context of what we're about to read next. That's what's new. Okay, and then verse 18, now all things are of God who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and, and listen, has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself. All of those parts of the anointing are reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses. There's the pardon not imputing the trespasses to them and has committed us to the word of reconciliation, committed to us the word of reconciliation. Okay, twice, you, well, you saw two things, the ministry of reconciliation and the word of reconciliation. Now I'm going to tell you how funny I am. I was really hopeful. I was like, oh, so like rhema word. He's committed to us the rhema or that, that active word of reconciliation to us, moving in the anointing. I'm thinking, I'm all excited about this. And so I look it up to make sure I'm right and I'm wrong. <laughs> that, that translation word there is actually logos. And I sort of sat there in disappointment, questioning whether the, lo the Lord had chosen the, <laughs> the right word for that spot. And so I thought, well, this is really bugging me. So um, I started to, to meditate and ask him to speak into why I was being bugged. Do you know that's a good thing to do? I just have to put that out there. The places for growth, the, the real blessings God has for you is the place where you're really bugged. <laughs> he's, he's the one doing it. So I look at it, and then I realize, what it, so what does this say? It says that he has committed to us the word, the Logos word, which is Jesus, okay, the word of reconciliation. And he begins to show me it's, it's, it is the perfect choice. And I'm going, oh, good choice, Lord. You were right. <laughs> we are the body of Christ. 
He has committed to us the logos word of the ministry of reconciliation. Reconciliation means to change mutually. I know I've, I've hit you with a lot of language. I was all laid up over it. It means to transform as you come into. Is that crazy? I want to tell you what, what we're doing here. Um, so in other words, we're called to the ministry of, of bringing the miracle of transformation as we bring people into Jesus. And the way, the anointing for that impossibility is the anointing of Jesus, which is your Jesus. People are crushed of heart. People are in survival mode. We have people in this room that are in survival mode. I am at least um, two of the seven days of the week. <laughs> and he never meant for us to be in survival mode. There is a realm that supersedes. This is inferior, and his spiritual kingdom is superior, and we bring the superior through the anointing. But you're not going to do it with working as hard as you can with the flesh. It is only by the anointing of the Holy Spirit that you're going to bring heaven to earth in anybody's life, starting with your own. That's the bottom line. And so if this is true, we need great competence. It's time for the church to quit being incompetent on these serious matters. We have to be the church that walks in anointing. Or what are we doing? And I know you have anointing. There's so much more. We're moving into an age where it's going to be time now. Um, religious habit that he's been stripping off through the year of 2020 is not going to cut it where we're going. It's a church that is going to be executing the will of heaven. It's going to be changing and transforming people's lives by, by the miracles that you're not capable of without the anointing is where we're going. That's what's going to survive where we're headed. I know this. So, <laughs> who's going? <laughs> so this is, um, this is what I want to do. Just, just for those who want to. Um, you can't work your way into the anointing. I want to offer you something that may position you to begin to walk into the competence we're going to start teaching about, okay? I want you to take a look at the Word of God in the Gospel of John, I mentioned already, says that for Jesus, the Spirit of God came upon and remained. I'm going to tell you what our problem is. We struggle. The Spirit of God came upon you or you wouldn't love Jesus. You wouldn't be sitting here. The Spirit is upon. Where we struggle is the remaining part, Okay? So I would, I believe the Lord would bless it. If you went and asked him, what in my life? Maybe there's a particular setting or certain things you're engaged in that, that on both sides of the equation. There are things about the way you've chosen, whether you know it or not, you've chosen, that you have your life structured and some of that invites the spirit to remain. And some of that is something that he's not comfortable being at home in. And so just ask him. He's gentle. He's kind. <laughs> he's not looking to beat you up. But he would love, I believe, for you to know what in your life is positioning you for the spirit to remain so that you can walk in your anointing. And where are you going? What are you doing? What are you thinking? How are you practicing your faith? That is not a place that is comfortable. That is not a place that the Spirit chooses to remain. Is that fair? You think you'll be blessed? A couple people are hoping for some blessing. Okay, is it okay if I pray for you on that? In fact, I want to pray specifically for that. I want to ask for the Holy Spirit to be all over that for whoever chooses to do it. Okay? Okay. Father, we want to be the place where your spirit remains. We thank you that you are uh, so delighted in us, that you planned us to be the place of your anointing, the place of, of your glory, 
the weight of your presence. We ask you to um, increase our power and authority to reveal your heart, Father. We want to bring the transformation in your moves, Holy Spirit. We don't want to do nice things anymore. We don't want to just be kind or be good people. We want to be people so full of you that we are participating in your miracles for people's lives, the miracles of the heart. And so, Lord, I ask a special blessing on any who leave to do this, any who come to ask you where they are and where they are not providing a place for you to remain upon. And I ask in the name of Jesus, in fact, I declare, there shall be protection from the enemy in this assignment. The enemy, I, I bind your ability to condemn or, or, or make us feel terrible because Jesus paid for it all. And I, so I bind that over this exercise in the name of Jesus. And I ask in the freedom of that space, Holy Spirit, that you would just move powerfully and just reveal the place of our anointing. I ask that you would shut down the things that are shutting down our anointing. I ask that, that this exercise, as people do this, that, that you would pummel and crush spirits of divisiveness, uh, that you would, you would crush spirits of discouragement over this body, that you would crush everything that quenches the anointing and your presence upon us as we continue to walk this journey. We love you, Jesus. We love you, Jesus. Amen. Amen.